So before you uh, tell us the, the problems you see with the initiative process, if you could first describe uh, what that is and how it works and how we got it. Sure. Uh, it's a response, or it was a response 100 years ago, to the principle that the, that the real power of government lies with the people. And in the early years of the 20th century, uh, a movement came to uh, place the power of legislation, and also recall, as a matter of fact, but essentially we're talking about the initiative, the power of legislation in the hands of the people by the process of circulating petitions, obtaining enough signatures to put a petition uh, issue on the ballot well, and I thought, putting uh, it on it by the people. I thought the people always had uh, the ultimate power here. So what does the, the initiative do in California that was a unique, at least in the early 20th century? Well, the initiative uh, put together, the initiative process coming into effect put together a clear way to do it and made it uh, available to the people. So previous to that, we had more of a Republican form of government where uh, the people's uh, wishes and, and uh, public will would be implemented through elected representatives, both in Sacramento and in Washington. And now the initiative process comes in and allows the people to directly enact a legislation or to, re or to reject uh, legislation passed by Sacramento. And as you say, uh, to uh, kick the bums out if they don't like the way uh, particular uh, representatives are moving, even prior to their uh, electoral terms being up. Yeah, in fact, another word for the initiative process is direct democracy. And what's wrong with direct democracy? It sounds exactly what the United States was founded on. Well, in the hundred years since it came in, the uh, access to the uh, direct democracy process has become much more typified by money by having enough money to be able to circulate petitions to find enough signatures to put things on the ballot. So this is just a, a, the a electoral uh, politics gone amok, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, in some ways, it's turned around from what it was originally envisioned. It was originally envisioned as a way to break mm -hmm. the lock of special interests and to provide the people with direct access to changing the statutes or changing the constitution of the state. And how does this differ in California, or how did it differ uh, back in uh, 1911 when it was first enacted in the state, from the way things work at the national level? Well, the way things work at the national level, there, there is no direct democracy. Everything is done through the House of Representatives or the United States Senate. And the people cannot pass an initiative to change the U.S. Constitution or to change a U.S. statute. Or to reject statutes. Correct. Or to even recall uh, senators and representatives prior to their terms being up. That's exactly right. California, on the other but, hand... So it sounds like this direct democracy is a great thing. Uh, well, why the, did it take us so long to find it in 1911? It, it is not an unalloyed great thing. We talk about the power being in the hands of the people, but what that means is that the process changes. Rather than the kind of deliberative, we hope, sort of process that a legislature produces, that is committees, considerations, hearings, Compromise. Uh, compromise and that sort of thing. Bingo, it goes on, goes on the ballot. It may be something that, for example, allocates funds, uh, takes up a substantial part of the, uh, the state fisc, if you will, and it happens because uh, somebody put it on the ballot and the people voted for it. So the process is gone, essentially, uh, the uh, legislative uh, process. Aside from, aside from the politics of the initiative process, uh, which when it came into California a century ago was somewhat unique, I believe we're the second or third state to it, right. adopt uh, direct democracy, as Don refers to it. Uh, but what have the consequences been for the last for California over the last hundred years? How has the initiative process served us, either poorly or well? Well, uh, I'll start with poorly because that's where I was going, and that is it has uh, essentially locked up a large part of the state's budget by the time we get to modern times in. Uh, allocated funds allocated to certain initiative uh, matters uh, that were on the ballot over decades before. So you're saying there's the, also Prop 13. We can get into that. Yeah, but you're saying the budget crisis that we've been talking about uh, is tied up with, uh, in, at least in part, with the initiative process. Yeah. What are some of the other things that it has done that have 
led to perhaps uh, impasse uh, in Sacramento? Well, for example, by initiative, we have limited the terms of legislators. Uh, you can serve three terms in the state assembly and two terms in the state senate. So what's wrong with that? We want to have citizen representatives. We want the farmers to go to Sacramento to, uh, to, to, to serve the state for a couple of years and then return to their farms and plow the fields. Carl, this is going to be fun. John voted for term limits and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so well, what's the problem with term let's limits? Let's hear him talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did vote for term limits because I thought it was a good experiment. Uh, and I believe in, in experiments. I think the problem with term limits as we look back on it has been that we have eliminated expertise by legislators. And it's a wonderful theory to have ordinary citizens, farmers, shopkeepers, and the like come to Sacramento, serve the people, uh, and then uh, return back to their hometowns. The problem is that government has gotten incredibly complicated and you need a lot of expertise to be able to do it well. And so if the legislators uh, themselves can't develop the, the institutional uh, memory and expertise because they don't serve long enough to acquire it and to pass it along, who does? Who fills that gap? Lobbyists. Well, lobbyists and staff. So now we're a state run by staff and well, lobbyists? In large part, yes, uh, because they're the only people who can stay long enough to understand how the process works, to know what's important, and and. Well, come and on, it, it can't just, be that hard to balance a hundred and twenty billion dollar budget, <laughs> well, the seventh largest economy in the world. That's exactly the problem, and it isn't just individual legislators, but it's also, for example, the speaker of the legislature, who is an incredibly powerful person under California's Constitution. You serve as speaker for a couple of years and then you're gone because so you're term limited you, out. And, you described this and you didn't start until you probably your second term. Well that's right. And you yeah. described this as an experiment. Okay, so that's good. So as uh, Louis Brandeis said, the states are mini laboratories of experimentation. Right. This experiment didn't work out, so let's uh, move on from it. Well, it's not so easy to move on for it because the term limits were put in place in the state constitution. We then have to change the state constitution to get rid of the term limits. So let's talk a, a moment about the state constitution. As I understand it, the first constitution was drafted before statehood in 1849. Correct. Um, and it was a fairly short document at the point at that time. Yes. And it was actually demanded by Congress as a condition for statehood. And and uh, we developed it. And, and am I correct that the uh, under the original constitution of 1849 that Spanish was a co-official language of California? That's right. In fact, the original state constitution was published in both English and Spanish and submitted to the voters for their approval in English and Spanish. And let's add a value judgment. It was a really good constitution given the situation well, that who, we were who, in at that who, time. who wrote it and how did they write it? A bunch of newcomers, which sort of cuts against the <laughs> the term limits thing. Because but I guess we were all newcomers. Well, but it was, well, it was a different all time. Because there were people like General Vallejo and Pio Pico, uh, Pio right. Pico and other grandees from the Mexican era who had become American citizens, but the majority of them were gold rush people. And so what did they do? They just kind of got into a room, let's say uh, the State House in Philadelphia, and sat around for a hot summer and decided what to put into a constitution? Well, they had other states' constitutions. Keep in mind that, that this was a very primitive time in California. Uh, you could get to California by going overland for four or five months. You'd get to California by sailing a ship for many months. Uh, it was before the Telegraph. It was before the Pony Express. And it was before gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill. No, no it, it was, was about after, a year after. It was oh, about a year and a half afterwards. Oh, I see. We got we got the state from Mexico before then. Right. the The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is is signed in February of 1848. About two weeks after the gold discovery. So. Correct, but but before anybody knew about it. Hmm. And so in 1848 and 1849, you had this huge influx of people from all over the world into California, which is... You mean we were kind of the melting pot of the world? Absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and we have been for 160 years. Hmm. Um, and in fact, we were even the melting pot of the world before we were part of the United States, because California was very much a hodgepodge of different nationalities even in the Spanish and Mexican times. 